Welcome, everybody. Thank you so much for turning out for this. Uh, my name is Tim Holmes. I'm an artist and a theater person in this beautiful town. And uh, I have been working with many of my compadres here. We felt it was our duty to get together and uh, try to talk about some ideas for how to unleash our creativity and cooperate on new ideas. Carl Jung is the founding psychologist of kind of a lot of modern psychology. He sort of pulled it out of the ether and made it understandable. He had a profound effect on modern society, uh, alerting us to the power, the creative power of the unconscious. And has a stellar reputation with one sort of dark spot. And that has to do with the, uh, the Jewish community after World War II. And many of the Jewish community that survived the camps afterwards accused Carl Jung of being a Nazi sympathizer. There was a, a prominent rabbi named Leo Beck. Leo Beck, the leader of the community, and Carl Jung got together after the war, spent two hours in a hotel room, and left lifelong friends. And I think, man, I want some of that magic sauce. <laughs> this play is a kind of a historical fiction. What do you think happened in those two hours? It's written by Murray Stein, who is perhaps the most famous human psychologist on the, on the earth today. And he did that in collaboration with Henry Abramovich, who is a, a Jewish professor in Israel. And the two of them collaborated to try to create this, to recreate this, what they think was the conversation. It's a very powerful study. And as we've been working on this play this year, it's, it's kind of a shame that, that the content of the play has become more and more prescient. You know, with Ukraine and Putin and Syria and just all of the, the bifurcation in the U.S. Uh, and we really need ideas for how to achieve reconciliation. I'm pleased to report that this is the Western Hemisphere premier, produ uh, premier production of Visit Life. <laughs> <laughs> Carson Yada is our cellist sitting here in the dark. We you will see him, I swear, when the lights come on. <laughs> and part of the music he's performing is music that was written in the chaos. Mm -hmm. And it adds a real dimension to the depth of what we're talking about here. The, the actors are also from the coast. Carl Jung is played by Skip Conover. Uh, Leo Beck is played by John Jackson. And the, the, there's a character called Woman who's played by Sherry Lowe. Please enjoy yourselves. It's, it's a one act play, so it's not going to keep all night. And we're hoping that you'll have time. So I'm just going to see some this.
But I am not guilty as charged. You're still dwelling on that? Then maybe you are. They're spreading such lies about me that I was an agent of Hitler. There's even a rumor that I'm hiding out somewhere in America and the FBI is investigating. You have to see him. He's in town, staying at the Savoy Hotel. Maybe he can help. He's a rabbi. Maybe even a sadiq. A righteous man. I remember him well. I do wish he had accepted our invitation to dinner at my place. It would have been so much easier. That Professor Young, such chutzpah, <laughs> wanting to see me as if we are old friends. After what he wrote in the times of persecution. But you know he was not a Nazi. Besides, he has so many Jewish friends and Jewish students. Doesn't matter. What he said was used viciously against us and, and caused extreme damage. How can I sit down with such a man? You can meet him here at the hotel. You refused his invitation to Kuznak, but this is a neutral place. Just to see what he wants. Could this it hurt now in 1946? It will not help my mission to restore the Jewish communities in Europe. I don't think you have to worry about that. Dreams. Sometimes I have to say I hate them. They don't leave me in peace. It's about her again, isn't it? Yes, I dreamt about Sabina again. She was running frantically, naked, being chased by Gestapo troops in black uniforms. Her daughters, too. They were running for their lives. The soldiers took aim and killed all three in cold blood. I was overwhelmed with anguish. And then that voice, it won't leave me alone. What did the voice say? Beck, go to Beck, see Beck, see Beck, like a broken record over and over again, see Beck, see Beck. Well? I w wanted to ask some questions. No chance. You can't talk back to a disinvited voice. I have to answer to it. Well? Where's my coat? I have to go see him. I have the feeling that he is coming here. <laughs> what will he say? What will I say? I just don't want to lose my temper. Why don't you just, <laughs> just leave me alone? <sighs> You're still recuperating. You need strength for this. But the nightmares, they keep coming back. But there have been some things, haven't there? There was one change. <laughs> Last night, instead of the Nazi guard shooting my friend David, a Russian soldier shot the guard. <laughs> I couldn't help but feel glad. <laughs> Maybe I should feel guilty. <laughs> but I just don't want to see him. <sighs> Rabbi Beck, it's Professor Jung. I would like to speak with you. They sit at the desk downstairs that he's in. Knock again. Rabbi Beck, please open the door. I want to speak with you. 
Okay, try one more time. If he doesn't answer after three knocks, he never will. Rabbi Beck, I beg you, please open the door. What do you want? I need to speak with you. I do not want to speak with him. But he is at my door. Please, enter. Finally, they have come face to face. Two tall men, both famous, both in their 70s. One a Gentile, one a Jew. They stand there stiff as boards. There's so much tension between them. They would like to leave, but they can't. Please, take off your coat. We could sit here. Thank you for letting me in. It's been a long time since we've seen one another. I heard you were coming to Zurich. How are you? Let's not waste our time on niceties, Professor. Why have you come here? What do you want? I came to explain, and I want you to know that I'm not guilty as charged. <laughs> Who charged you? What is the charge? There are many vicious rumors floating around about me, spread by my enemies, that I was a Nazi, that I'm anti-Semitic. There's even a rumor that I worked for Hitler. This is not true. I've done nothing to deserve this. I have one question for you, Professor Young. Did you stand up to that great evil in that time that everyone could see? I heard that you were in the camps. I'd like to hear about your ordeal and how you survived. What you're asking is not easy to give. But I can tell you a few things, and I am willing to listen to you. But do you remember my question? You are relaxing a little. That is good. You seem to be eyeing each other with less suspicion, but you have not yet let down your guard. Maybe a conversation could become more possible as you sit together. It would be so good if you could talk more freely with each other. May I respectfully ask you a question, Rabbi Beg? Which of my writings have you read? And what have you heard about me? I see no need for a lengthy recitation, Professor. My basic question is this. Why didn't you stand up and denounce Hitler when you knew so well, as the great psychologist you undoubtedly are, what a dangerous and pathological man he was, and what a threat to humanity and civilization? Why didn't you speak up? You're asking if I was a coward. I've been accused of that by some of my best students, including Irish Neumann. I've asked myself this question many times since being accused in the Zurich newspaper by my friend Gustav Bali. A man of your stature should have spoken out publicly and loudly against what was happening in Germany, and not just for Jews, for psychiatric patients, didn't you realize that they, too, were also being exterminated? How do you explain your silence? I do find your tone quite harsh, Rabbi Beck. I'm human. I, too, have anxieties about my health and well-being. In those early days of Hitler, I had hopes that Germany would recover its place in the world after the devastation of the Great War. And I was not alone in that prospect. Many people chose to be naive about Hitler and the Nazis. We, too, hoped that soon they would be gone and life would get back to normal. You must know that many of us Jews were ardent German citizens and patriots. <laughs> but to Hitler, of course, this was meaningless. Racism replaced patriotism. <laughs> Suddenly, we were outsiders, <laughs> aliens. It was a shock, let me tell you, and it took years to absorb and to believe it. Why didn't you leave? Surely there were many opportunities. I had no choice. I'm a rabbi. I would never abandon my people nor betray my profession. It was my duty to stay.
You are both remarkable men, exceptional in your achievements, but separated by a deep rift. Can you find a way to share your thoughts after these terrible years of suffering, betrayal, trauma? What can become of this conversation? What do you want from me, Professor Young? I had to make contact with you. I'm not sure why. I had some dreams that directed me to see you. I had to come. I also had no choice. I came to explain. Or so I thought. Now I'm not so sure that's the reason I'm here. Could we just sit for a bit and talk? I left you a short note after a lecture you gave in Darmstadt in 1930. You had to rush away at the time. I remember that I said that I appreciated what you had said and I found it valuable in my work. And I didn't reply, but I always remembered it. Those were very busy days for me, Rabbi Beck. I'm sorry I didn't write back. <laughs> well, they were very busy days for me, too. <laughs> As you can well imagine, I was president at the time of the German Rabbinical Association, and I had many duties to perform. Your name was well known to us in Berlin. <laughs> Some of your students were in my congregation. <laughs> we looked to you for psychological insight and guidance. So <laughs> you can imagine our shock and betrayal when you wrote so insensitively in 1933 about Jewish psychology. And I was the president of an international medical psychotherapy association in that time. I was asked to take that role. And against my better judgment, I took it out of a sense of responsibility. I was trying to make a case to keep psychotherapy going in an increasingly hostile German nation. Remember, you made it possible at Bad Nochheim in May 1934 for the Jewish doctors who had been excluded to keep their professional status in the organization. My German friends and Jewish colleagues begged me to take this role. Surely you understand my dilemma. I would have much preferred to stay out of politics in the neutral Switzerland. <laughs> and might there have been a different motivation as well? What do you mean? I mean, Professor, a motivation that is a little less noble. Germany was a big prize, professionally speaking. Freud was out now, and you could step in. Please hear me out, Rabbi Beck. I was trying to make the case that there's more to psychology and psychotherapy than Freud and Adler. This was to protect the profession and not to advance myself. Of course, this landed me in all kinds of hot water. As you say, I've been accused of trying to use this opportunity to advance my profession in the nation of Germany. But this was never uppermost in my mind. Well, excuse me? Isn't it true that you used this opportunity to advance your presence in the professional world in Germany. <laughs> this fell into your lap and you used it. Yes, that was the impression of the profession at that time. But that was never my foremost intention. Of course, I did realize at the back of my mind that this put my psychology in a privileged position in Germany. <laughs> As you might say, in the shadow. If you have to put it that way, I have to admit it. Things are moving forward. Young is beginning to sweat. This must be starting to feel like analysis. <laughs> <laughs> the rabbi is laying there some hidden The conversation motivation. is becoming more real, less defensive. Young is a proud, Young is a proud man. This is this very is uncomfortable for him. I was in Berlin, Professor Young, and I can tell you the Nazis were thrilled to have your blessing. It gave them a big name internationally, all around the world. I was at a loss as to what to say to members of my congregation, especially as I had been promoting your ideas. What could I say now? You wrote, and I quote, 
The Jew, who is something of a nomad, has never yet created a cultural form of his own, and as far as we can see, never will, since all his instincts and talents require a more or less civilized nation to act as host for their development. How could you have written that we Jews were parasites, <laughs> not able to form a culture of our own, <laughs> only living off the culture of others? <laughs> This is something straight out of Mein Kampf. <laughs> Didn't you realize how the Nazis would use your words about Jewish psychology? In those articles and interviews, I thought that somehow, partially, allying myself with the German collective at that time, I could find a space to say some other things, to introduce a little psychological reflection to bring a little more consciousness to this nation possessed by rage and resentment. Let me tell you something about Jewish psychology, Professor Young. We German Jews were unprepared for the rise of the Nazis because we felt more German than the Germans, <laughs> like two souls in one body, German and Jewish. <laughs> Other countries were afraid of the Germans, but. We Jews loved Deutsche Kultur with its Dichter and its Denker. Every Jewish schoolboy knew his Goethe off by heart. I have to admit, we were afraid of the Jews' success. To us, the Jews were a threat. And so, the Nazis made up a deceitful story to cover their <laughs> resentment of our success. They screamed, the Jews stabbed Germany in the back. <laughs> Did you know in the Great War <laughs> that the youngest volunteer for the German army was a Jew? Nine. Yeah, only 13 years old. And the first member of German parliament to volunteer for the front and who died for the Vaterland was Jewish. 35,000 Jews were decorated for their bravery. <laughs> 12,000 died. May their memory be a blessing. I myself served as an army rabbi for all four years of the war. And then suddenly, in 1933, we were aliens, vermin, a cancer on the body politic. Our rights were stripped from us. We were hunted down robbed, murdered, terrorized. Young looks like he has seen a ghost floating in the air between them. Obviously, looking back, it was a mistake. I did not register the terror that you speak of. I was deafened by so many other voices. <laughs> you are letting yourself off lightly, Professor Young. That is a poor excuse. These statements will never be forgotten or forgiven. It's beginning to dawn on Young how far he underestimated the seriousness of what he has done. He is finding it difficult to look the rabbi in the eye. He has nowhere to hide. You know, Professor Young, as I sit here in the comfort of the Savoy, in this fine Swiss hotel, I think of the contrast of the camp that I lived in for three years, Theresienstadt. Do you know about it? Yes, of course. It's north of Prague. I believe it was the site of that Nazi film during the war. There were some pictures in the newspapers. <laughs> and maybe you saw me there, <laughs> listening to a lecture as if I was in Heidelberg. <laughs> the truth <laughs> was very different. 
That's the reasons that I was a horse <laughs> every morning. <laughs> While harnessed to a wagon with a fellow Jew, I hauled garbage and dead bodies. <laughs> Not until I experienced it with my own eyes did I understand what it meant to live in one of those camps. <laughs> Bunks <laughs> were were built with four or five decks, so, so you had to lean over, far over, when sitting upright, <laughs> for your head to be in the clear. <laughs> the worst of it, the worst of it was the dirt, <laughs> the teeming myriad of insects, <laughs> the hunger that just never went away. <laughs> Separation from loved ones was excruciating, but sometimes being together was even worse. Four of my sisters died at Theresienstadt. Frida, Lisa, Anna, and Rose. Kafka's sister, Freud's sisters. Once I had dysentery and I, I soiled myself while waiting in line. How did you survive the humiliation and the suffering? Do you know the meaning of my family name, Beck? Nein. It's, it's an acronym of two Jewish letters, uh, Bet and Kuf. Uh, when pronounced together, it becomes Bech, uh, a short form for Ben Kadosh, uh, meaning son of the holy ones, or for the martyrs who died sanctifying the holy name. Not until I was arrested did I understand the meaning of my name, Bech, as my destiny, my fate. <laughs> my name gives me strength. Ben Kadosh, Bech, your name touches ancient layers of the psyche. My name is a rather new. Jung means young. Maybe that's the reason I got carried away by a new wave of energy in Germany. A new leader had emerged, a figure of great strength and determination. I was fascinated at first. We are now looking back after the catastrophe. Our judgments were very different in 1933. I disagree. Of true, in 1933, no one could see the depth of the evil that was to come. We had no idea, no precedent, but, but we Jews certainly felt the deadly threat right from the start. We had a knife at our throats from the moment the Nazis came to power. This is where you went wrong, Professor Young. You were deaf and blind to this threat to so many in your neighboring country, Deutschland, you looked the other way. You know, <laughs> Professor Young, some memories still haunt me. November 8th, 1939. Do you remember? Yes, of course. The infamous Kristallnacht. <sighs> I can see it as if illuminated by a flashbulb. I remember exactly where I stood, what I saw, what I smelled. After the shattering of the glass, a deadly silence fell over Berlin. <laughs> Crystal knocked. <laughs> but the silence began to speak. It was difficult to know the right way to act. I myself made it a principle to never accept any appointment, assignment from the Nazis, to do nothing, nothing to help them. But when the question arose as to whether to allow Jewish orderlies to pick up Jews to carry them to transport, well, I took the position that it would be better for them to do it because at least they would be more gentle and careful than the Nazi police. 
when the Nazis dissolved the Jewish fraternal organization, B'nai B'rith, I was arrested because I was the grand president. In prison, they insisted that I, I sign over all B'nai B'rith property, but I refused. In the retrospect, I too should have refused, just refused. But I was presented with terrible choices. You seem to be peering into the abyss, Professor Young. Let me remind you, Professor, that your life did not depend on what you did or didn't do. Mine and my people's did. I had no choice but to do the best I could. I am a rabbi. Every day I recited Psalm 56. Be merciful to me, my God, for my enemies are in hot pursuit. All day long they press their attack. My adversaries pursue me all day long. In their pride, many are attacking me. And when, when I am I'm afraid, afraid, I put, I put my, my trust, trust in, in you. We entered the camp. We entered the camp. After a reason, Stott, we each received a transport number. This was, this was the only evidence of our existence. <laughs> My number was 187-984. I was 187-984. <laughs> this numbering system had the effect of officially deleting our personal identities, our, our names, our histories, and inwardly threatened to cancel a sense of self. We were as the dead. <laughs> you see, that, that was the mental battle we had to keep up to, to see our fellow prisoners and ourselves not as transport numbers, but as persons. How did you maintain your sense of worth as human beings under those conditions? Well, for one thing, I was aware of the spiritual and intellectual hunger of the people around me. Now, when the Dutch Jews started arriving, I heard the Gestapo agent calling out their names. Asher, Myers, Delevy, Frank, Beninga, Mesquita, Israel, Gans, Kohn, Tuchinsky, DePasta. As I heard their names, I could see in my mind's eye the entire history of the Jewish Netherlands dating back to the 17th century. These people were scholars and intellectuals, artists and musicians. So I decided, then and there, to start a lecture series. <laughs> we met at night in one of the barracks, in the heat of the summer, the cold of the winter, in the dark, <laughs> with some candlelight. I could make out some of their faces. Sometimes hundreds of people crammed into that cold and gloomy attic, pressed close together for warmth. To <laughs> to hear a lecture about Spinoza, or the Talmud, Aristotle, or the Bible, Plato, or Isaiah. A sense of unity arose out of this mass of suffering. These were hours of freedom in which we were transformed back into human beings. We also had Choirs, uh, opera, <laughs> children's opera, <laughs> original chamber music, <laughs> and also cabaret. 
<laughs> with its defiant jokes. <laughs> this was my favorite joke. A Jewish father you know, is teaching his son to say grace before meals. Uh, but today in Germany, the, the proper form of grace before meals is to say thank you, God and Hitler. Oh, but the young boy replies, well, but what if the Fuhrer should die? And the good father says, well, in that case, you just say, thank you, God. <laughs> <laughs> Under such conditions, laughter. When the two men laugh together, their faces brighten. They begin to enjoy the company of one another. Still, darkness prevails. Rabbi Beck, you stared into the face of absolute evil. Were you ever tempted to curse God and die? No, I did not curse God. Every day, I said Kaddish over the bodies of those who had died. Glorified and sanctified be God's great name throughout the world which he has created according to his will. May he establish his kingdom in your lifetime and during your days and within the life of the entire house of Israel speedily and soon and say, Amen. May his great name be blessed forever to all eternity, blessed and praised, glorified and exalted, extolled and honored, adored and lauded, be the name of the Holy One, blessed, blessed be, be he. he. Beyond all the blessings and hymns, praises and consolations that are ever spoken in the world, and say, Amen. Amen. May there be abundant peace from heaven and life for us and for all Israel, and say, Amen. Amen. He who creates peace in his celestial heights, may he create peace for us and for all Israel and say, Amen. 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 When I hear these ancient words of the prayer for the dead, a shiver runs across my back and down my spine. I can see a light emanating from your face when you speak the ancient words of the Kaddish prayer. To give my people hope in those dark times, I would recite the passage from Ezekiel. Son of man, can these bones live? And I said, You know, O Lord. And he said to me, Prophesy to these bones and say to them, Dry bones, hear the words of the Lord. I will put breath into you, and you will live. I shall put sinews on you, I shall grow flesh on you, I shall cover you with skin and put breath in you. And you shall live. I heard my grandfather speaking these ancient words of Ezekiel in Hebrew. He was fluent in the ancient tongue and believed in the return of the Jews to the Holy Land. Do you know who was the camp commander at Theresienstadt? Professor Young? Nein. His name was Sturm von Führer Ra. His name, ironically, means cream. <laughs> Imagine. He was the one who was responsible for that infamous propaganda film that showed Theresienstadt to be a beautiful summer camp. <laughs> and when the filming was done, he 
personally escorted one of the house mothers who was in the film to the transport going directly to the Auschwitz gas chamber. This is Mrs. Zucker. It is your responsibility to see that she is in the arms of our husband tonight. <sighs> that was wrong. Perhaps this is the moment to tell the rabbi about your experience. He seems open to you. Rabbi Beck, your words have touched me in a profound way. I came to you and you told me your story. Now I have something that I want to tell you. Yes, please go ahead. It occurred a couple of years back when you were the, in the hellish world of the camps and I was separated from family and from clients, it occurred in a Zurich hospital. In that time, I feel I was brought close to you in some uncanny way and I will never forget it. It happened in the year 1944 a bitter cold winter that year. The war was still raging on and the outcome was still in doubt. I slipped on the ice in the street one day and broke my leg. For some days, I lay in the hospital and then an embolism developed and made its way to my heart. I was at death's door. During the day, I lay in a kind of half coma. I didn't want to eat. I didn't want to live. But at night, I would revive a bit. Of course, there were drugs involved to ease my pain and induce sleep. But that's when things became really surreal. The young nurse who was working with me, now took on the prospect of a kind old Jewish woman. She served me ritual kosher dishes. I was so grateful for her kindness and loving presence. And then when I looked at her closely, and this is most strange, I saw a blue halo around her head. Tell him your vision, what you see. In this state, I myself, or so it seemed, was in the Pardes Rimonim, in the Garden of Pomegranates, at the marriage of Tifereth and Malkuth. Or, I was at the wedding of Rabbi Simon bin Jokai in the afterlife. It was the mystic marriage according to Kabbalistic tradition. I cannot tell you how wonderful it was. I only kept saying to myself, now this is the garden of pomegranates, and this is the marriage of Malchus Earth. and Tiferet. Dear Rabbi, I cannot tell you what part I played in it. At bottom, I was the marriage, and my beatitude was that of a blissful wedding. Dear Rabbi, now I think this is the reason I came to speak with you today, to tell you this. <laughs> Do you understand why you had this vision? You are silent. Perhaps you understand and do not understand. Do you understand? It's still very dark to me. But it touched me so deeply. The mystic marriage changed me profoundly. 
do, do you think that this vision came to you to awaken your inner connection to the Jewish soul? This must be true. The Jewish features of my anima image have long fascinated me. My father knew Hebrew. My grandfather spoke it. I was surprised by this Jewish part when I worked with a patient many years ago. And when I studied the Kabbalah, I could feel it. This must be my connection with the Jewish soul. Your, your vision has touched me deeply, Dr. Young. And now, there's something I'd like to speak with you about. I will listen as an analyst. It is in confidence. Go ahead, I'm listening. It's about... It's about a decision I made. Go ahead. It's about a decision that I made in the gray zone. The gray zone. Uh, where good and bad are blended, and you can't tell them apart. Yes. It was in the summer of 1943, a year before the Red Cross visit and the filmmaking. A Czech engineer named Grunberg came and asked to speak to me alone. He swore me to silence. Promise me you won't tell this to anyone. I have to tell this to someone. My best friend, who was half Jewish, was sent to the East. He ended up in Auschwitz. He knows what goes on there. He knows what everyone at Auschwitz knows. He bribed a guard to get into Theresienstadt. He wanted to warn me and to save me. From that day, I knew it was not just a rumor about Auschwitz being a death camp. I debated with myself, was it my duty to convince Grunberg to appear before the Jewish Council of Elders in Theresienstadt and to speak the truth? To speak or not to speak? <laughs> yes, exactly. That was the question. I realized that if the council were informed, that the entire camp would know within just a few hours. Living in with the expectation of death by gassing would be unbearable for the people. But you could... Uh, please, I know what you're going to say, but please, listen. I have been criticized for keeping silence. I say, I had this horrible knowledge, but no arms. No underground organization, no weapons, no means of mounting a, a fight in the camp. I'd seen the reprisals in Berlin. And on the transports, if someone escaped, well, then someone else was just put in their place. Destroying hope is like murder, even more brutal than death in the gas chambers. <laughs> if the people had known <laughs> just what those transports to the East really meant, would they have been able to hold up? So you had to keep this terrible secret to yourself. But you see, you see, death wasn't entirely certain. There was a selection for slave labor, and perhaps, perhaps not all the transports went to Auschwitz. Only only? I felt that it was my duty to give my people hope. And so I came to a grave decision. To tell no one. To tell no one. But the worst was that some people did come to me and ask whether they should go on the transports 
to the east. I miss my husband so much. Should I go? What do you say, dear Rabbi? Um, what could I say? <laughs> Even though some did survive the transports, did I make the right decision? Would it have been better to have everyone know what I knew? To put up a resistance against the transports? To go down fighting? Rabbi, please, are you saying I should go? Is there something you're not telling me? <laughs> this, <laughs> this memory haunts me. If you had told people that they were going to the gas chambers of Auschwitz and to put up a fight, would more people have been saved? I don't know. But, but did I make the right decision? If you had to do it over again and to make a similar decision, would you make the same decision? Well, later, at another time, I did make a different decision. It was in January of 1945. I heard feverish activity in the fortifications of the camp. Deep tunnels were being built for storage, they said. <laughs> that didn't seem likely. Their only purpose could have been to serve as gas chambers. So we put the word out that if the SS should order any group to go into those tunnels, that they should just lay down, just lay down wherever they were. <laughs> there were only a hundred SS left in the camp at the time, and it would take two of them to carry each one of us <laughs> to a gas chamber. Maybe this is your answer to your question from the gray zone. <laughs> what are you saying? That you were presented with the same situation, but you acted differently. Isn't this the essence of the Jewish idea of tzuva, of repentance, and of returning to the way? In, in January of 1945, <laughs> I was scheduled to be executed. <laughs> See, what happened was like something out of a Dostoevsky novel. I ran into Eichmann by chance. See, <laughs> he was there to do an inspection of the camp. He went pale. You're still alive? <laughs> you see, see, what had happened was that another rabbi back from Moravia had died in the camp, and Eichmann thought it was me. <laughs> well, so orders were issued to have me killed. I was prepared for this. I, I gave my wedding rings to my friend Jakob, uh, in case he should survive, to give them to my daughter. <laughs> and then, just then, at that very moment, <laughs> at the very last second, <laughs> the Red Army arrived <laughs> and liberated the camp. You were saved for a reason. <sighs> this is undoubtedly so. How did it feel when you left the camp for the first time? To see once again a meadow, a wood, <laughs> a flower. <laughs> I did not go to bed hungry. <laughs> to be once again among the living and not among the dying. I think you can imagine the, the joy and the relief that I felt. See, then, then I would start to remember things. Sometimes a hundred a day would die in the camp. And the next day, again. And the next day, even more. I could see their ghosts in front of me, the ghosts of those who died and the ghosts of those who led them to their deaths. I, I did not want to leave the camp embittered with rage for revenge. Because in that case, they would have won the war after all. Can you forgive the Germans? <laughs> I forgive the Germans? <laughs> Hardly. 
<laughs> that is for the Germans to figure out for themselves. <laughs> what was done cannot be made right. <laughs> the Germans need to examine their attitudes which allowed Nazism to flourish. <laughs> they need to look deep into their souls, <laughs> at their history, their symbols, <laughs> their religion. <laughs> See, revenge <laughs> hmm. is forbidden us. <laughs> it is reserved for God. Say it. Go ahead and say it. Rabbi Beck, as you were speaking, I felt something happening inside myself. And now there's something that I want to say to you. Yes, please. Go ahead. As you were speaking, my mind was in turmoil. This happens to me sometimes in analysis with a patient. So then what happens then? I wait to see what comes. So tell me, what did come? Do you know Verdi's Requiem? Oh, yes, of course. It's a famous piece of sacred music designed to bring rest to the dead and peace to the living. I thought of a section of the part called Dies Irae. It is the day of wrath, the day of judgment. These words came to me. Quantus tremor es futuris, quando ludex es ventoris, comta stricte. Everything strictly. In psychology, I've learned that sometimes others can know us better than we know ourselves. And when they curtain of self-deception falls away. We see ourselves as we are seen, as we are in that moment. And tell me, what have you seen? I see a man who followed too easily the way of convenience. I see that I did not consider myself carefully, that I turned the other way, that I slipped too easily off the path of consciousness. In the Bible it says, on the day of judgment we will see as we are seen, and that is a shattering experience. I see a man who is seduced by ambition and blinded by fear. <laughs> yes. I do not stand in judgment of you, Professor Young. <laughs> judgment is not mine to give. I know that, but the judge is present as I stand here before you naked. I see myself in another mirror, a mirror of harsh truths without distorting angles of self-deception. I see now that I fell into a darkness that was invisible to me then. Yes, yes. You can't forgive me. I don't ask for that. But I do hope that we can be reconciled. And maybe I can be reconciled with myself. Can there be reconciliation without forgiveness? I never knew any Jews in my childhood. 
very few in my university years. I never felt closeness to anything Jewish. This was changed dramatically in the vision that I told you about. Yes, I can see that now. When I went to see Freud in Vienna, I respected him, but I did not feel close to him. I have to admit that I did not cry out loudly when his books were being burned. I was deaf and insensitive, and now I see that I was tragically misguided by the habits of collective consciousness. I see now that I fell off the path, that I went astray. Ich bin ausgerutscht. But why <laughs> did you continue to not speak out against the Nazis after those early years? Even then, you kept your silence. Surely you must have seen what was happening to Germany once Hitler took complete power over the nation. That is what I mean by Ich bin ausgerutscht. I fell off the path. Now you see why the voice led you to speak to Rabbi Beck. My dear Professor Young, surely you know that Jewish wisdom and tradition sees that falling off the path can be a prelude to getting back on the path, even to tikkun olam. Tikkun olam? Tikkun olam, repairing the world. It is dark in here. Can you see the way ahead? I cannot see the way ahead. The spirits of the dead are here, and they demand answers. How can I answer them? You will write about the nature of evil and divine darkness. Are you not thinking about a book? A book from the Bible? Perhaps the book of Job? An answer to Job would be a way ahead. Here is your path. Are you ready to follow it? I must. You lead the way. And Rabbi Beck, what will you do now? I will continue my work restoring the destroyed communities. And? And? The work of Tikkun Olam. <laughs> oh, that too. Yes. In the grave zone? <laughs> we all live in the gray zone. <laughs>